All right, hi everyone. Uh, I've got 11 o'clock, so we're gonna start now. Um, if you can't hear me, if you're having any technical issues, just feel free to pop it in the chat um, or unmute yourself. I'm not sure if you have that option. I think you should, but anyway. Um, so thanks for joining online today. Uh, my name is Natalie Vielfor. I am the Digital Curation Archivist for Research Services and Digital Strategies uh, at the University of Manitoba Libraries. Uh, my job mainly involves digital preservation and curation, which entails ensuring that data remains usable and understandable for as long as needed. So if uh, your research data needs to be preserved for five years or 10 years or, or however long, uh, I can help provide guidance on what steps you may need to take to make that happen, uh, including how to make sure that you're depositing good data when that time comes. Uh, before we start today, uh, I'm working from home, I'm sure many of you are as well, um, and that comes with a few distractions that were not an issue for previous in-person sessions. Uh, the main distraction today is potentially um, Bezzy, my Shih Tzu Husky Beagle Cross, so uh, she's a big dog personality and a small dog body. Um, provided there are no doorbells or other outside noises that get her attention in the next little bit, we should be fine. Uh, but I just wanted to give you um, a heads up on potential barking um, or distractions. Um, and I'll do my best to keep an eye on the chat as well throughout, uh, but feel free to ask questions whenever, unmute yourself, um, or however you're comfortable asking questions. Um, and hopefully we don't have too many technical issues today or none at all, uh, but it is the first time I'm running this session online, so just bear with me. Uh, so, our learning objectives today are to examine the current Canadian data management context. As part of that, we're briefly going to talk about why data deposit and data management are important in our current context. We're also going to talk about the possible constraints that you might face when submitting your project or your data for deposit. Uh, so, we'll go over some data management and preservation considerations to ensure that you're depositing good data when you're at that stage. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about Dataverse and mSpace, two institutional repositories available here at the U of M, uh, and what their roles are in the context of your research obligations. We'll also briefly go over a few more deposit options uh, outside of the U of M. So why deposit? Uh, research funding agencies have expectations when it comes to data management. This is particularly relevant in today's Canadian context. In 2016, the Tri-Council agencies made up of the Canadian Institute of Health Research, the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council released a statement highlighting new expectations they have for researchers who apply for grant funding. These expectations include better data management practices, uh, that consider preservation, retention, and sharing, and all of these functions relate to deposit in different ways. Uh, the tri-agency policy is in draft form. It was meant to be released uh, this last March, but with everything going on, it's been delayed. I think it's going to come out in July with a possible official launch in the fall. Um, if you're planning to share your data, then deposit facilitates dissemination. Uh, both mSpace and Dataverse can assist with this, and we'll talk about those tools a bit later. Uh, some publishers today also ask you to deposit your data in an open repository if you're publishing through them, and then they may require proof of deposit for your data. In these cases, depositing through Dataverse and mSpace will allow you to have a digital object identifier for your, DO, uh, for your data, also known as a DOI, um, and that's often required by publishers who want proof of deposit. Uh, if you're planning to deposit, you also need to consider the retention of your data and employ preservation actions accordingly. You need to start thinking about the preservation of your data prior to deposit because your deposited data is only valuable if it's still usable and accessible at the time of deposit. Uh, preservation may mean different things to different people. You may have uh, requirements that make it so that you have to preserve your content for at least five years. It might mean you have to preserve it forever. 
uh, there's varying kind of retention policies depending on your funding agency requirements and other potential obligations and agreements. Um, so you need to start thinking about how long your data needs to remain accessible and what actions you need to take to ensure that you're depositing good data. So we're going to start off today by talking about data preservation. Uh, a lot of research data lifecycle graphics, like the one on the screen, consider preservation late in the process. But it's really something that you should be thinking about from day one when you're planning your research and keep thinking about throughout the life cycle of your data. If you didn't consider preservation from the beginning, you might find that your data is no longer accessible when you're ready to deposit. Uh, the purpose of digital preservation is to make sure that your data remains accessible and reusable either by you or by others where applicable over time. The best way to ensure this is by using the current best available formats. Uh, stable, more widely used software is more likely to remain accessible over the course of your research. It's also important to back things up regularly to prevent data loss and store your files on multiple devices stored in multiple locations. Risks to preservation of your data can occur at different levels. Your data can be compromised at the file, software, or hardware levels, for example. And considering all of these factors, your digital data has an average lifespan of five to 15 years, depending on the different formats, software, and hardware that you might be using. That data could last longer than that, or it might not even make it to five years. Just to illustrate a few different points in your data creation and collection that might affect the preservation of your data and your ability to deposit, let's say you determine the best way to record, manipulate, and reuse your data was through a spreadsheet. Well, at the heart of it, that spreadsheet is just binary code. It's a series of ones and zeros, and at any time, a zero might change into a one or vice versa and could cause a minor, unnoticeable change to your data or something more serious. If your data is corrupted, Having regular backups will allow you to restore that data. Having copies of those files will also help you recover the data if needed. That being said, you'll most likely only notice a change and be able to restore a backup if you're alerted to that change or if you're actively working in that file. If you don't open that file regularly, there are ways that you can be alerted to a change when it happens. Um, there are a few tools that do this uh, and that you can install to monitor changes in your data using something called checksums. A checksum is an alphanumeric value assigned to a file to help monitor changes in the files. So let's say, for example, you run a report using one of these tools on your files. It'll assign the checksum value seen here um, to your spreadsheet. Unless you're actively working in that file and editing it, that value shouldn't change. If you schedule a regular checksum uh, check, you would be able to more proactively identify unintentional changes in your data. Tools like this wouldn't necessarily tell you what's changed, but they tell you which file has changed. So you could then go and review the file, see if it's something that's you know serious or noticeable, or it might just be something that's not even perceptible. Um, and then depending on your assessment, you could restore a backup or go uh, get a copy of that data somewhere. If you notice that the value of a checksum changes, then it means that something has been altered or corrupted in some way, which would further prompt you to restore a backup or check for other copies. Um, there are a number of tools that can help you monitor changes in that way. Uh, Fixity by AV Preserve is one tool that is freely accessible. Uh, it also has really good documentation online on how to install and use it, um, but there are also other options out there and feel free to, to do some research on those. So those are just a few uh, examples of issues that might happen at the file level, but you also need to consider the software you're using to render the file. Ideally, it needs to be a common and stable format. If you're using something that no one else is really using, there's not a lot of buy-in for that product, potentially. So there's a greater risk that that software might not be supported for very long. It might also not be easy to reformat that file to a more commonly used file format at a later date. If you're compiling research data over a long period of time, the software you're using could also go through multiple versions. So it's important to make sure that you update your versions. Um, it might not be a big issue if you're one version behind, but if you started working in version 1.0 and you leave that file for a few years and the next time you open it, you need the latest 4.0 version, it might be harder and maybe even possible to bring your file up to that version. 
usually moving from one version to the next can be done in a fairly straightforward way because those who support the software know that when they develop version 2.0 their users will need to crosswalk their files from 1.0 to this newest version uh, so if you move along with the software company then it's fairly easy but if you don't move along with them eventually they stop supporting some of their older versions so if you're still at version one when they're coming out with version four you might find that you can't update from one to four in one step you can't even get to version three um, because the company might only have the two latest versions and you can't update 1.0 without first going to 2.0 which is no longer available so this is why you'd want to use more up-to-date software the most up-to-date versions and more commonly used in stable formats you could also opt for open source options. Uh, so for example, for spreadsheets, uh, LibreOffice Calc is an open source option, meaning that the source code is freely accessible to be used, manipulated, and enhanced. And your continued access to the software doesn't rely on a company that may or may not continue to support that software or any version of it. If you do use less commonly used software and it's still functional over the course of your research, you probably should, should still consider converting it um, at the end of your project to something more commonly used, particularly if you're um, intending to make that data accessible to others or preserve it long term. In terms of access, um, other potential users of your data will need to download and open your data to interpret it and they won't be able to do this if you're using software that no one else has access to or that's very expensive to install so uh, where possible opt for open source or commonly used tools and software um, that are stable and just generally think about your file think about your software but also think about the hardware you're using so um oh, what too far uh, let's say you're storing, storing your files on uh, an external hard drive. External hard drives have an estimated lifespan of two to five years. They could last longer or they might not even make it to two years. Um, also, why, while this is not a likely issue you'll face in the short term, also think about how people previously store their data on floppy disks, zip disks, and then think about the last time you saw a computer with a built-in floppy disk or zip disk drive. Unless you've been to my office recently, and honestly, even I haven't been there in a few weeks, uh, you most likely have not seen one of these in a while. Um, so this is not a regular everyday workstation. It's what you need to pull out when someone comes to you with old hardware that they didn't think about for 15 years. Um, so what I'm getting at is when we talk about hardware issues that might impact the preservation of your data, we're not just talking about whether your storage devices are functional but also whether the computers you use to read uh, what's on these devices can still support the hardware if um, you're compiling your research for a few years. So it's good to refresh your hardware as needed uh, if you're doing more long-term projects. And also keep in mind that hardware is vulnerable to natural catastrophes. If you have multiple copies of your data, maybe don't store them all in your basement office that's prone to flooding. One flood and your data is potentially gone. So there are a few different views on how many copies are enough copies to ensure that your data is securely preserved. And that's something you can also determine based on your own comfort level um, to make sure that you can continue to access your data throughout your project. But a lot of people will advocate for the three to one approach. So that three copies on at least two different types of media with one copy stored in a separate location. Your three copies include your original data, which might be stored on your computer, and then on top of this, it's good to have two copies on external devices, two external hard drives, for example. In this case, it's also good to get two different brands of models of external hard drives, just in case there's a defect that might impact a single type of external hard drive. Um, and that's the same if you were storing it on like a USB key or something. Just make sure that if you're using the same type of external hardware, you're getting different brands. Um, and then store one in at, least in at least in a different location. Um, so if two copies are in your office, maybe store one with another collaborator for your project, preferably in a different building if possible. Generally, consider the retention of your data as well and just be thoughtful in your decisions when you're considering what software and hardware you're using to support and access your files. If you're looking at keeping your files accessible over five years, before you deposit, you may need to update your systems, migrate your files to more current formats, refresh your storage media, et cetera, to make sure that you're submitting good data when you're ready to deposit. 
But even if your data is accessible, the data also needs to be understandable. If you deposit your data and you make it accessible to others, will they understand what the files are? If you're part of a research team, did you provide the necessary context to ensure that the files you created are understandable to your colleagues in the event that you leave the team? Can the data be understood by someone who is not the primary creator of it? Good data requires good descriptive metadata, data about data, that lets those who might benefit from your research understand what it is. It needs to be independently understandable and reusable over the long term. Depending on the nature of your research, you may be using specific metadata standards, um, but if you're not sure what kind of metadata you should be documenting and how you should be recording it, you can always contact us and we can talk you through it or refer you to a metadata librarian, depending on your needs, and I'll have some contact information up um, during the presentation later on. Good file naming practices should also be used. File naming should be consistent, descriptive, and concise. File names that are too long can cause issues later on, so try and stay under 25 characters for your file names. If you have multiple files with similar content, choose a single file naming convention for those files, including the same information in the same order, and adding a value to differentiate files with same or similar names, like a versioning number or a date. This will help make your file names understandable to others. If you're using numbers to differentiate files with similar content, make sure that you're considering scalability. If you're creating between one and nine files that share the same naming convention, so for example, they're all called case file, um, and you have case file one, two, three, then adding a singular digit might work. But if you're thinking about creating somewhere between one and 100 files, then use three digits consistently for all files to ensure that they sort properly when they're saved and appear in the proper order. Make sure users of your data will also understand how file one and 100 are different. Avoid special characters in your files, including periods, which might cause issues with your file extensions um, and any kind of punctuation, brackets, etc. Spaces can also be problematic, as not all software recognizes spaces. So use underscores, hyphens, or camel case where each new word starts with an uppercase letter. Uh, you could also use a combination of, uh, of these in a single naming convention. So for example, uh, this naming convention includes three types of values, author, title, and date, spaces between words or numbers that are part of the same values, like the surname and the given name of the author, are separated by a hyphen, while the spaces between separate values, like the space between title and date, use an underscore. Also consider your file organization and relationships between files. Is navigating through your folder structures intuitive or will someone other than you struggle to find what they're looking for? Can you replicate that organization when you deposit? Did you create relationships between different files that won't be preserved once you deposit the content? For example, if you're highlighting a connection between two documents, hyperlinking might be a really useful way when you're working with your original files to do that. You can just click on that link and it'll open your other files that you need access to. Um, but those links are based on where your files are located within a given directory at the time you create that link. So after deposit, your files are no longer in those directories and those relationships are no longer in play. Your hyperlinks will lose that context and will break. If you want to reference other documents in your data, something like a see also note that includes the full file name will better preserve the relationships between your files. And if your data is well organized, it should be easy for a secondary user of your data to find the files based on that information. If you're converting your files to another format at a later date, there may be some things you can do when creating the original files to minimize cleanup later as well. So for example, if you're working in Excel, you can create multiple worksheets in a single Excel workbook. But if you're planning to convert this file to a CSV file later on, you'll lose all but the first worksheet in that process. So rather than compiling your separate sheets into a single document, you might want to start by creating a separate Excel file for each sheet instead to minimize kind of that cleanup that you might have to do at the end of a project. Generally speaking, it's good to keep your final goals in mind when you're starting to compile your data and start to pick your software and your files. Um, 
If you want to work with specific software, but your final output needs to be presented using a different type of software, knowing ahead of time whether these different types of file formats are compatible and how easy it is to convert from one format to the other and what cleanup methods you might need to consider um, might influence how you compile your data early on. So those are just a few of the things to keep in mind while you're doing your research and uh, creating your data so that when you're ready to deposit, your work is accessible and understandable. If you're seeking to deposit your content with the U of M, you have a few options, and we're gonna talk about two specifically today. The first is Dataverse, which was originally created by Harvard University. Dataverse is a locally hosted open source data repository administered by the libraries. Essentially, the libraries provide the service and are the first point of contact for any questions you have related to Dataverse and deposits. Uh, IST then provides the technical infrastructure behind Dataverse in terms of storage and backups. This means that your storage, uh, your data is stored on local servers, which is good to keep in mind if any of your agreements with funders or other parties require you to store your data on Canadian servers. IST further ensures that objects deposited in Dataverse are backed up regularly to ensure continued access to your data for the duration of its retention. Dataverse allows you to store, share, and publish your data and make it discoverable for others. It supports these functions in numerous ways, such as providing scholarly data citations, which can help with data requirements from publishers and funders. It allows users to create multiple collaborative environments containing data sets, metadata, and digital objects that can be shared either openly or privately, depending on your access permissions. So when you're depositing in Dataverse, depending on your preferences or any requirements set by the Research Ethics Board or other parties, you can make your data freely accessible and downloadable, or you can limit access to a select number of people. You can also make it accessible to those who ask permission so that you can monitor who is accessing your data and make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Dataverse also has different metadata levels, including file and data set uh, levels of metadata, and that will help make your work more discoverable overall. In terms of the structure and terminology of the repository, uh, the Dataverse repository has Dataverses, data sets, and files. So the term Dataverse might refer to the repository itself, or it could also be a structure within the repository. It's essentially the collection level of your data. Um, and then it can also include data sets and other sub Dataverses for each Dataverse created. Uh, so looking at this particular uh, Dataverse, uh, it has one data set and one Dataverse. The icons on the left-hand side of the results will let you know if it's a data set or a dataverse. Each data set and dataverse will include citation information uh, that users can copy, including your persistent identifier, that DOI. Um, and then below the citation, there's also basic uh, descriptive metadata. So there's um, some information about the data set. There are subjects associated with it, in this case, social sciences. Uh, there's keywords that are associated with the data set as well and other notes that are relevant to the data set. In the data set, you can also look at the individual files within that data set and uh, relevant metadata, terms of use and access, and versions. The files can be downloaded under the file tab um, if permitted. And in this case, a request for access button allows those interested in accessing the data to request permission from the original depositor, who can then in turn allow access on a case-by-case -case basis. The metadata provided at the data set level provides descriptive information about the data set, the title, the authors, the contract for the data, or the contact for the data, um, and also shows the data set DOI. The terms of use area of the data set provides information on how people should use and access the data. So it might include a note that people must cite your data if they're using it. If some files are restricted, you can provide further information about that. Which files are restricted, who can access restricted files, and how they can gain access if applicable. You can also add a guest book, which would require users of your data to add information such as their name, email, institution, and position in the, uh, in the guest book. The versions tab uh, in the data set will identify any changes to a project. So if you uploaded more 
uh, a more up-to-date version of your data later on. Rather than overwriting the original data, it will show your original data version 1.0 and then the more updated version 2.0, for example. If Dataverse is of interest to you, you can inquire about depositing here, provided that you have a University of Manitoba affiliation. Um, this includes U of M students, faculty members, staff, researchers. If you're working with partners from different institutions, so long as one of these partners has an affiliation to the U of M, uh, the data can still be deposited here. To deposit, you should be doing so for one of the following purposes. Uh, dissemination, where depositors are seeking to make their data accessible uh, to others, which could be just their specific research team or it could be the greater public. Um, it can also be for collaboration, where files may be stored in Dataverse so that they are accessible to all members of a given research project who need regular access to the files or maybe just access to your grant funding agency or to REB. Uh, compliance, where depositors need to deposit their content to comply with the requirements set by a funder, publisher, etc. Or teaching, where files are stored so that they are accessible to students requiring access to a particular data set as part of a course assignment. So if you can deposit in Dataverse, uh, what can you deposit? In terms of file formats, anything can be deposited, but as we previously went over, if someone else wants to access the data and your permissions allow for that, they'll be able to download the data, but they'll only be able to really uh, access the, the records if they have the software to support it. So while all formats are accepted in theory, it doesn't guarantee that they'll be openly accessible to everyone who wants to access it. Again, that's why we kind of encourage use commonly used formats that are more accessible to people. Um, in terms of file size, any individual file within your data set cannot surpass two gigabytes. Uh, you can deposit a maximum of five gigabytes in Dataverse. Anything over that will have to be reviewed and approved by the libraries on a case-by-case -case basis, just to make sure we have the resources um, to support a larger data set. Similarly, anything that goes through a health research ethics board review will also have to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, just to make sure everything is properly anonymized. Um, and no clinical health data, such as patient charts, will be accepted for deposit. If you're interested in depositing in Dataverse, you can get started um, by contacting your liaison librarian and asking about setting up a meeting to go over specific deposit requirements and start the deposit process. And you can also reach, reach us at library research services at umanitoba.ca. If, if the Research Ethics Board uh, or a grant funding agency or other requirements set limitations on how you deposit your data and for how long, it's also important to make sure that they are aware that you intend to deposit your data in Dataverse and have approved that, um, and that we're aware of the retention period that it needs to be accessible for or deposited for. To set up an account, you'll need an email, prefer preferably a UManitoba email, uh, and make sure it's an email that you have continual access to and that you monitor regularly as we want to prevent the data from becoming orphaned. Uh, just as an example of what I mean by orphan data, let's say hypothetically a graduate student was the administrator of a Dataverse account, um, and they graduate and they move on to another institution, their UManitoba account was shut down. Meanwhile, Dataverse still ties that data to that grad student's email. So if anyone clicks the contact button in Dataverse, whether it be requested uh, re to request access to the data or ask permission for reuse or citation of the data, or just to ask any kind of general questions about the research, um, the request would bounce back or it will remain unanswered and they have no means of getting the information they need. So it's better to, if a Dataverse administrator uses an email that they monitor regularly and will maintain access over a long period of time or for the duration of retention. Um, you might also want to come up with a plan in the event that you are no longer actively monitoring or have access to that email. Is there possibly another researcher on your team that could take over as administrator of that Dataverse, for example? Um, and if so, the current administrator of any Dataverse can reassign the administrative responsibilities to someone else on that Dataverse. Uh, to learn more about Dataverse, you can also visit the link on the slide uh, for more information. And so there's a Dataverse guide there and that's where the more up-to-date information will be. Another option for deposit is mSpace. 
uh, similar to Dataverse, mSpace is also open source. Uh, the libraries provide the service support while IST supports the storage and backups of deposited content. You also have metadata fields uh, that can be populated to enhance the discoverability of your data. Unlike Dataverse, your data will be open once deposited in mSpace, so you don't have that same ability to customize access to your needs. For some content, you do have the option to restrict your content completely for up to a year, but the end goal of anything deposited in mSpace is open and permanent access. You also have access to different types of statistics with mSpace that give you insight on where and how your data is being used, which we'll talk about in, in a bit. Uh, and in terms of citation, a DOI can be provided, but it has to be on request. So if you need a DOI for proof of deposit, um, you can contact us again and uh, arrange to get a DOI for any content deposited in mSpace. You can also link uh, anything in mSpace to your ORCID ID uh, once you deposit. So ORCID, for those who aren't familiar, is a unique persistent identifier for researchers, analysts, and scholars that helps you connect all of your research activities, no matter your role and the institution you belong to. So if you deposit a data set at the U of M, and then a few years later, you publish an article while working at another institution, you can tie all of these activities to a single ORCID ID. This makes the process um, a lot easier. For example, if an employer or a funder is looking into your scholarly activities and they want to find everything you've worked on, um, having an ORCID ID makes things easier considering that you might not always be publishing uh, under the same name or your name might be expressed differently in a different language. There might also be other authors with the same name as you. So an ORCID ID is a good way to clarify your relationship to all of your scholarly activities. So if mSpace is of interest, you can look into depositing here, uh, but like Dataverse, you do need a U of M affiliation. Uh, again, this includes U of M students, faculty members, staff, researchers. And then in terms of what you can deposit in mSpace, uh, multiple file formats are accepted, some of which are listed here. Uh, the full list is available at that link below. Unlike Dataverse, there are limitations in terms of what files can be deposited. Um, so again, if you have any questions about particular formats, you can check that list to get the most up-to-date information. In terms of content, mSpace is used for records like publications, theses and dissertations, research conference and working papers, uh, among other types of records. Overall, any content deposited in mSpace must be scholarly, teaching, or research-oriented. And once you deposit in mSpace, you can also access different types of use statistics. For instance, how many people are downloading your thesis or publications, how many people are looking at your abstract. If you click on those statistics, you can also get information on how many people can access your data per month over the course of the last year, and statistics on where your content is being accessed in terms of countries and cities. If you're depositing your research publications, you have similar stats, but you have a bit more information as well. Um, you'll see not only the statistics from users of mSpace, but also those of other repositories where your content might be deposited and accessed. So for example, this publication has multiple authors. One author is from KINREC at the University of Manitoba, which is why that publication is in mSpace. Uh, another author though is from Utah State University. Um, and so the content has statistics from Utah State's Digital Commons repository as well. Um, so those statistics will help you track usage across these multiple repositories so that you're not just getting statistics from mSpace, you're seeing usage statistics from multiple repositories where that publication is accessible. In terms of how to deposit, uh, when you're ready, you can sign on to mSpace here and then follow the steps when prompted you'll be asked to uh, specify whether you're submitting a thesis or a research publication and then depending on what you choose you'll be given different prompts. Uh, part of this includes providing metadata for your deposit so you'll be asked to specify which collection you're depositing in so is it part of faculty of graduate studies collections or research publications collection. You'll be asked to provide the names of the authors of the works deposited, the title of the works, the name of the publisher, uh, where applicable, the citation for your item, etc. And as previously mentioned, DOIs can also be provided upon request. 
there are further resources online that go over um, deposit in mspace and the link is up on the slide uh, they mainly deal with thesis deposits but the steps are similar um, so more information can be found at that link or also if you go to the library's homes page and go to the graduate student section there's resources on mspace Uh, so both mspace and dataverse provide you with ways to make your data more visible and reusable um, but just to recap and compare and contrast a bit uh, they both facilitate sharing and dissemination of your data and enhance its discoverability through metadata both repositories also ensure that your deposits are made accessible over the long term and are securely managed they both also allow for self-deposit um, Dataverse and MSpace can also help you comply with the requirements set by your funding agency or RAB, uh, but MSpace can only help you comply with those requirements if it supports, um, if your, your requirements support you making this openly accessible and permanently accessible. Dataverse provides you with uh, more customized access options where you can set restrictions based on your specific requirements. It also makes Dataverse an ideal tool if you're looking for secure file sharing options with your research team. Uh, MSpace prevents you with more metrics to measure the impact of your research, while Dataverse supports deposits that include a greater range of formats. Uh, based on your deposit needs, one might be better suited than the other, but they are both great options for anyone looking to deposit in an open institutional repository here at the U of M. A few things to consider before you deposit. Uh, if you're depositing a publication, make sure that the publisher's copyright agreement and electronic publishing policies allow you to deposit both with the publisher and a U of M open repository. If you have the intention to deposit your records in an institutional repository such as MSpace or Dataverse, make sure that you verify this doesn't violate any previous agreements that you've made with the publisher. If your works include copyrighted materials, you have a photograph produced by someone else in your publication, for example, make sure you have permission to use that material. Another thing to consider is that through MSpace, things are publicly accessible as well as downloadable by other users. So by depositing um, publicly accessible content here, you are giving the university the right to freely distribute your work through that kind of download link that gets generated when you deposit. For this reason, uh, users can freely download your work, which means we're also pre permitted in that same way to reproduce your work through those downloads. Um, to ensure continued access, you're also giving the university the right to preserve your work, which means that we might have to adapt software to the latest formats and things like that. So technically, it gives us the right to adapt your original files, but it's just to make sure that they're continually accessible if for some reason a format like a PDF is no longer supported more widely. Um, this also applies to Dataverse, depending on your access permissions and your data retention period. The content you deposit in MSpace should also be deposited with the aim of making it permanently available, so you shouldn't use this repository if you have an agreement with REB that says that your data can only be accessible for a few years and then has to be taken down. Um, also consider that anything deposited in MSpace like I said, is meant to be kept permanently, but for Dataverse, it can be deaccessioned. So um, deaccessioning is not quite deletion. So what this means is that um, the data itself will be deleted. So like your files will be taken off of Dataverse when that retention period expires, but the description of the content that was there will remain. So we'll still have that citation information that people can refer back to. Uh, also make sure that your content is in password protected so that it can be indexed properly and make sure that none of your files include personal information such as addresses, signatures, student numbers, etc. The type of deposit may also determine where your content ends up. Uh, so for example, if you're depositing a thesis, it'll go in MSpace. If you're depositing content with formats that aren't accepted in MSpace, then Dataverse will probably be the best option. Uh, if you're only depositing scholarly publications with no accompanying data, then MSpace will be better suited. Um, but if you have data sets, then again, that will be better uh, suited for Dataverse. Other questions you might want to ask yourself before choosing a repository. Uh, are there specific metrics you would like to see when you check your deposit? How are your files organized? Could you use that Dataverse data set structure and version control functionality offered by Dataverse to mirror that organization? 
uh, where does similar research data exist? So maybe people are depositing related or relevant content to yours and they're using mSpace more than Dataverse and it would be more beneficial to deposit it there in case people are searching through there and can come across relevant material. Uh, which repository supports your entire deposit? So independently, mSpace would better support your publications and Dataverse would be better suited for your data set. But if you have both and you don't want to keep them in two separate repositories, um, even though they're both like searchable through the library's catalog and online, um, then maybe you want to keep them together in Dataverse since Dataverse better supports the data set aspect and also still supports that publication um, component as well. Overall, though, if you're not sure uh, which repository is the best fit for you, you can always contact us as well to talk about it further. Uh, and we might also recommend, and you can also freely look into this, but other options outside of the U of M. Um, so feel free to do your own research on other deposit options that might work better for you. Um, so like us, Scholars Portal has a Canadian hosted instance of Dataverse. So it's very similar to uh, the U of M library's instance of Dataverse, but it's Canada wide. Um, they support deposits from numerous institutions and again it's hosted on Canadian servers. There's also FURTER, the Federated Research Data Repository, um, which is a good option for anything over five gigabytes. Uh, depositing in FURTER is mediated through the institution, so the libraries would assist you in depositing there if that's the repository of interest uh, for you. If you're not sure which repository to use, you can also always contact us. We can help uh, make that decision for you, even if it ends up that you prefer not to put it in a U of M repository, uh, we can find out what might work best for your needs. And that's it for me. Uh, so thank you for your time. Um, I've included our unit's contact information at the bottom as well as my own um, if you ever need support with your research. And if you have a moment, you can also fill out the evaluation uh, linked under feedback on this slide. Um, and just give us some feedback on the workshop, um, the good, the bad, whatever. Uh, any feedback is appreciated. And now we have time for questions. If anybody has any questions. I'm sorry, turns out I wasn't getting kind of chat notifications throughout this. I'm sorry if I noticed some people had audio issues. I'm hoping that eventually it worked. make this a bit bigger. Um, for the question about naming files by date, if it's better or if detail of samples, it really depends on the file types that you're you're creating. Generally think about how you want files to sort. So if every if you have like consistent values like like the example I used where I said um, you could name it like case file 001, um, that would sort in the order like 0, 01, 2, 3, 4, 5 properly. But if you started, let's say you wanted your files to sort by year, then putting that date value first would help you do that. So just think about how you want those files to naturally sort and stay together. And that usually will help you determine um, what the better way of naming your files is. Um, it again try to be concise and consistent in how you format those file names but otherwise like how you format those particular file names is really up to you just so long as you again keep in mind that under 25 characters is ideal and that you're formatting things consistently uh, can we limit availability of other people to our data in dataverse or mspace Dataverse has flexible options um, for what's available to other people. So if you have a login and associated to that login, you have access and special permissions to certain data sets, then you'll be able to access those data sets. Uh, if you went to Dataverse right now without a login, you can only see what's publicly accessible. Uh, permissions are very flexible. So you have the administrator that has full access, but then you'll have people that only have access to download the material, this. Some of them can open it in the browser. Um, some people can see just the metadata. They can't actually access the files. And you can customize that level of accessibility for the entirety of the Dataverse, or you could also change permissions based on a particular data set within your Dataverse. Uh, 
Uh, I can definitely, if anybody is interested in accessing um, the presentation, I can send it out. Uh, maybe just send me an email. Again, my email is on that slide and I can send you the slides. And yeah, I can send the recording out as well. Dataverse can be used as a collaborative space for um, data that needs to be stored and accessed by a specific team. And again, you can set different kind of permissions for what kind of access you want people to have. Um, you can't edit live in Dataverse. So it's the idea that you could update, you could put in version one and people could all access version one in Dataverse or download it if they want. And then if you made changes to that, then you could um, update it with version two later on. It wouldn't overwrite version one. It would make sure that you have that full version history of all the files that you um, have previously put in Dataverse. Uh, how do we deposit data deposit on Dataverse before the publisher online version, which is copyright protected? Um, it will depend on what kind of uh, agreement that you have with the publisher. Um, you can, if they want you to deposit first so that you have that link, it would be just going through the libraries and asking them to set up, to help you set up that Dataverse. Uh, and then you could use that link and integrate it into your um, publication. And then if there are certain restrictions, like the publisher wants you to deposit your data, but doesn't want you to make it openly accessible, then you can set those kind of cop, those, um, access permissions differently or have people request access. Uh, it does not cost anything to deposit data with the libraries. It's a free service for both MSpace and Dataverse. Uh, do the special characters and file names include accents? I'm working in a language that has accents. Um, some software, it doesn't, it's not an issue. Some more commonly used software, it shouldn't be a problem, but there are um, softwares that are more kind of specific. So if it's kind of like Microsoft Office type software, then accents shouldn't be an issue. But if you can still make sense of the titles without the accents, like just for the file names themselves, then maybe avoid them just to be like sure that it'll work across multiple softwares um, and operating systems. But otherwise, accents on characters should be fine. Um, for deposit, you will need a Dataverse account, um, and then it'll have to be approved by the library so that you have those permissions to um, create and add to that Dataverse. So usually what happens is you'll put in a request through the libraries, and then uh, we'll set up your top-level Dataverse and make you the administrator so that from that point on, you can make all those changes in your Dataverse, create data sets, and assign permissions and things like that. Uh, each data file has three different versions, original data, analyzed data, and figure from data. Should I upload all the files or only the files that other people can understand the final figure? Um, it depends on the purpose of your deposit. If you're using it to collaborate with a research team, then you can put all of it up there so that your whole research team has access to what they need. Um, you can like make different permissions. So if there's something that's more um, like friendly for the general public or like other researchers outside of your team that want access to it for research purposes, then you could only make certain, those like kind of final deliverables publicly accessible to people. Um, but then you could restrict the things that you think that people might not be um, as interested in seeing, like if they don't wanna see kind of the draft versions, the, the earlier versions and things like that. Yeah, it might be difficult with diacritics potentially um, if there's a way of working around that, but I think more commonly used softwares should be okay. Again, it's just kind of, it, if you're gonna move that over to a different kind of software later on, um, that file name might not translate well or it might not work well with other um, operating systems. So yeah, just maybe be mindful of that and and, yeah, but otherwise it should be fine in more commonly in stable formats. Uh, so camel case is rather than putting a space between different words, you just start every new word with a capitalized letter. So um, instead of that space between camel case, it would be capital C, 
for camel and then no space and just case with a capital C to specify that they're two different words. Researchers in other provinces do have access to Dataverse provided it's publicly accessible to them, provided your permissions allow for that. Um, and in terms of depositing in it, you do have to have um, someone on that research team that has an affiliation with the University of Manitoba, but you can assign permissions to people outside of the institution and outside of the province as well. I think that's all I see for questions. Um, but I'll stay on the line a bit, and if anybody else has other questions, feel free to pop them in. But otherwise, that's it for me. So thank you all for coming. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me or Library Research Services as well. Thank you.